Welcome. This is Weep for Adonais, a collaborative reading of Percy Shelley's Elegy for John Keats. Uh, I'm Brian Rejack. I'm one of the founders and editors of the Keats Letters Project. You'll, you'll hear from all of us at some point today, uh, all six of us. Um, it's, it's been a really remarkable day. I've been going from one Zoom event to another, uh, different commemorative events uh, on, on this date. So we're now very excited that we have 15 wonderful readers who are going to um, be reading Shelley's poem for us uh, over the next half hour or so. It's about how long we expect the, the reading to take. Um, and in the interest of time, um, uh, instead of reading uh, everyone's bios, I'm going to put a link in the chat. And if you go to that page, you can read bios for all our readers. And I'll also post the bios in the chat as each reader goes. Um, a few technical details to go over. Um, we're going to try and make sure that everyone stays muted who's not uh, uh, reading um, <laughs> and then uh, there will be conversation after when we'll be able to ask questions and talk and whatnot. Um, so don't feel bad if one of the the co-hosts of the meeting mutes you. Uh, it's just we're gonna try and notice if people are unmuted so we can avoid stray sounds during during the reading. Um, and we also have the live transcript function enabled. So if you look at the bottom and you want to turn on the subtitles, uh, the this this version of Zoom generates automatic uh, transcript, uh, which is it'll be interesting to see how it handles uh, the text of the poem. Um, and we also have the chat enabled. So feel free to use that. Um, during the reading to say, you know, way to go um, to, to whomever. Uh, and then, uh, of course, at, at the end as well, we can use the, the chat for questions and things like that. Um, and I think that's all you'll, you'll hear from me for, for now, basically. Um, we are recording as well. This will be made available uh, in the next day or two um, once we have the, the recording. All, uh, all set. And I am now going to turn things over to Anne McCarthy, who's up next. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us here this afternoon slash evening slash night slash morning, wherever you are. Um, I'm going to basically read our own preface to the poem. We've decided to sort of put, put Shelley's in suspension and add some remarks at the, at the beginning to say why we weep for Adonais. Sheer grief at his absence has overshadowed the absent one. Now it is more painful, but still easier to write not about the one we have lost, but rather about our own loss and those of us who have suffered it. Thus remarks Roman Jakobson in his Elegy for Mayakovsky, an essay titled On the Generation That Squandered Its Poets. Something of the same emotion permeates Percy, Percy Shelley's Adonais. As we come to Shelley's poem on this day, February 23rd, 2021, we may feel this as well. It's true, of course, that the mythology Shelley weaves around Keats in the poem's preface, the myth of a poet delicate and fragile, a young flower blighted in the bud, poor Keats, with susceptible mind, dead more or less of a bad review, has proved to be a durable one. Yet as my KLP colleague Ian Newman so eloquently wrote this past weekend, it's also incomplete, particularly when one turns to the letters themselves, as we've of course been doing with the He's Letters Project. There, as Ian reminds, we encounter not a forlorn figure cut off in his prime, but an energetic, vital young man, hungry for the world and capable of imagining new ways to be in it. And here, it's perhaps worth noting that Keats and Shelley, who were certainly friends, were far from being intimate. It's easy to forget that for no, that fact for no other reason that Shelley, of course, will end up being buried in that same cemetery as Keats by the end of 1822. And of course, Shelley would not have known of Keats's self-professed awkward bow in his final letter. 
And Shelley obliquely acknowledges this fact, I think, in, in his own preface with the mention of Joseph Severn, the person who was actually with Keats at the moment of his death. And so in Adonais, Shelley's outrage at the, you know, at the anonymous reviewers who hooted Keats from the stage of life, in some sense, takes the place of the emotional intimacy in the future that was not to be. The poem is not, or not only, about Keats himself, but about the loss that had been suffered, and those who, like Shelley, felt that they had suffered it. And what of us 200 years later? Working with the letters has allowed us at the KLP to put off our reckoning with Keats's early death, but we still can't quite say that we've been taken by surprise or that it changes our world as profoundly as it might have Shelley's. What then do we mourn as we weep for Adonais? In part, we join Shelley in mourning the poems that might have been written, the ideas that might have arisen if these poets had been allotted a longer stay on earth and you know, more time to be together to talk with each other. That's a familiar grief, of course, to those of us who love the second generation of Romantic era writers, especially as we watch ourselves grow older than they ever got to be. More than that, however, we may find, our, find ourselves joining Shelley's outrage, here anticipating the sentiments of Allen Ginsberg's Howell or Jakobson's essay on Mayakovsky, at a world that seems almost uniformly arrayed against beauty, truth, and poetry. We read today as the United States alone has registered half a million COVID-related deaths, and when so many of us have lived for so long under deteriorating conditions of work, thought, and general flourishing. If we have reconciled ourselves to the loss of Keats in a way that was never available to Shelley, we weep nonetheless for those who have not survived the ongoing darkness of our present moment. Born darkly, fearfully afar, we affirm the possibilities of the poetry and the letters reaching out to our own uncertain futures. Adonais is dead, long live Adonais. Adonais, an elegy on the death of John Keats, author of Endemion, Hyperion, etc. I weep for Adonais, he is dead. Weep for Adonais, though our tears thaw not the frost, which binds so dear a head. And thou, sad hour, selected from all years to mourn our loss, rouse thy obscure compeers and teach them thine own sorrow. Say, with me died Adonais. Till the future dares forget the past, his fate and fame shall be an echo and a light unto eternity. Where wert thou, mighty mother, when he lay, when thy son lay, pierced by the shaft which flies in darkness? Where was Lorn Urania when Adonais died? With veiled eyes, mid listening echoes, in her paradise she sate, while one with soft enamored breath rekindled all the fading melodies with which like flowers that mock the course beneath, he had adorned and hid the coming bulk of death. Oh, weep for Adonais, he is dead. Wake, melancholy mother, wake and weep. Yet wherefore? Quench within their burning bed thy fiery tears and let thy loud heart keep like his a mute and uncomplaining sleep for he is gone, where all things wise and fair descend. Oh, dream not that the amorous deep will yet restore him to the vital air. Death feeds on his mute voice and laughs at our despair.
Most musical of mourners, weep again. Lament anew, Urania. He died, who was the sire of an immortal strain, blind, old, and lonely. When his country's pride, the priest, the slave, and the liberticide, trampled and mocked with many a loathed rite of lust and blood. He went, unterrified, into the gulf of death. But his clear sprite yet reigns over earth, the third among the sons of light. Most musical of mourners weep anew. Not all to that bright station dared to climb. And happier they, their happiness who knew, whose tapers yet burn through that night of time in which suns perished. Others more sublime, struck by the envious wrath of man or God, have sunk, extinct in their refulgent prime. And yet some live treading the thorny road, which leads through toil and hate to fame's serene abode. But now thy youngest, dearest one has perished the nursling of thy widowhood, who grew like a pale flower by some sad maiden cherished and fed with true love tears instead of dew. Most musical of mourners weep anew. Thy extreme hope, the loveliest and the last, the bloom whose petals nipped before they blew died on the promise of the fruit is waste. The broken lily lies, the storm is over past. To that high capital where kingly death keeps his pale court in beauty and decay, he came and bought with price of purest breath, a grave among the eternal. Come away, haste, while the vault of blue Italian day is yet his fitting charnel roof. While still he lies, as if in dewy sleep he lay, awake him not. Surely he takes his fill of deep and liquid rest, forgetful of all ill. He will awake no more, oh, never more. Within the twilight chamber spreads apace the shadow of white death, and at the door, invisible corruption waits to trace his extreme way to her dim dwelling place. The eternal hunger sits, but pity and awe soothe her pale rage, nor dares she to deface so fair a prey till darkness and the law of change shall o'er his sleep the mortal curtain draw. Oh, weep for Adonais, the quick dreams, the passion-winged ministers of thought who were his flocks, whom near the living streams of his young spirit he fed and whom he taught the love which was its music. They wander not, wander no more from kindling brain to brain, but droop there whence they sprung and mourn their lot. Round the cold heart where after their sweet pain, they ne'er will gather strength or find a home again. And one with trembling hands clasps his cold head and fans him with her moonlight wings and cries, our love, our hope, our sorrow is not dead. See on the silken fringe of his faint eyes like dew upon a sleeping flower, there lies a tear some dream has loosened from his brain. Lost angel of a ruined paradise, she knew not twas her own. As with no stain she faded like a cloud which has outwept its rain. One from a lucid urn of starry dew washed his light limbs as if embalming them. Another clipped her profuse locks and threw the wreath upon him like an anadem, which frozen tears instead of pearls begem. Another in her willful grief would break her bow and ringed reeds as if to stem a greater loss with one which was more weak and dull the barbed fire against his frozen cheek. Another splendor on his mouth alit, that mouth whence it was wont to draw the breath which gave it strength to pierce the guarded wit and pass into the panting heart beneath with lightning and with music. The damp death quenched its caress upon his icy lips. 
and as a dying meteor stains a wreath of moonlight vapor, which the cold night clips, it flushed through his pale limbs and passed to its eclipse. And others came, desires and adorations, winged persuasions and veiled destinies, splendors and glooms and glimmering incarnations of hopes and fears and twilight fantasies, and sorrow with her family of sighs, and pleasure blind with tears, led by the gleam of her own dying smile instead of eyes, clean in slow pomp. The moving pomp might seem like pageantry of mist on an autumnal stream. All he had loved and moulded into thought from shape and hue and odour and sweet sound, lamented Adonais. Morning sought her eastern watchtower, and her hair unbound, wet with the tears which should adorn the ground, dimmed the aerial eyes that kindle day. Afar the melancholy thunder moaned, pale ocean in unquiet slumber lay, and the wild winds flew round, sobbing in their dismay. Lost Echo sits amid the voiceless mountains and feeds her grief with his remembered lay and will no more reply to winds or fountains or amorous birds perched on the young green spray or herdsman's horn or bell at closing day since she can mimic not his lips more dear than those for whose disdain she pined away into a shadow of all sounds. A drear murmur between their songs is all the woodmen hear. Grief made the young spring wild, and she threw down her kindling buds as if she autumn were, or they dead leaves, since her delight is flown for whom she would have, for whom should she have waked the sullen year? To Phoebus was not Hyacinth so dear, nor to himself Narcissus, as to both thou, Adonais. Wan they stand and sear amid the faint companions of their youth, with dew all turned to tears, odor to sighing Ruth. Thy spirit's sister, the lorn nightingale, mourns not her mate with such melodious pain. Not so the eagle, who like thee could scale heaven and could nourish in the sun's domain her mighty youth with mourning, doth complain, soaring and screaming round her empty nest as Albion wails for thee. The curse of Cain light on his head who pierced thy innocent breast and scared the angel soul that was its earthly guest. Ah, woe is me. Winter is come and gone, but grief returns with the revolving year. The airs and streams renew their joyous tone. The ants, the bees, the swallows reappear. Fresh leaves and flowers deck the dead season's bier. The amorous birds now pair in every break and build their mossy homes in field and brier. And the green lizard and the golden snake like unimprisoned flames out of their trance awake. Through wood and stream and field and hill and ocean, a quickening life from the earth's heart has burst as it has ever done with change and motion. From the great morning of the world, when first God dawned on chaos, in its stream immersed the lamps of heaven flash with a softer light. All baser things pant with life's sacred thirst diffuse themselves and spend in love's delight the beauty and the joy of their renewed might. The leprous course touched by the spirit tender exhales itself in flowers of gentle breath. Like incarnations of the stars, when splendor is changed to fragrance, they illumine death and mock the merry worm that wakes beneath not we know, dies. Shall that alone which knows be as a sword consumed before the sheath by sightless lightning? Then tense Adam glows a moment, then is quenched in a most cold repose. Alas, that all we loved of him should be but for our grief 
as if it had not been, and grief itself be mortal. Woe is me. Whence are we, and why are we? Of what scene the actors or spectators? Great and mean meet massed in death, who lends what life must borrow, as long as skies are blue and fields are green. Evening must usher night, night urge the morrow, month follow month with woe, and year wake year to sorrow. He will awake no more, oh, nevermore. Wake thou, cried misery, childless mother, rise out of thy sleep and slate to thy heart's core a wound more fierce than his with tears and sighs. And all the dreams that watched Urania's eyes and all the echoes whom their sister's song had held in holy silence cried, arise. Swift as a thought by the snake, memory stung from her ambrosial rest, the fading splendor sprung. She rose like an autumnal night that springs out of the east and follows wild and drear the golden day, which on eternal wings, even as a ghost abandoning a bier, had left the earth a corpse. Sorrow and fear so struck, so roused, so rapt Urania, so saddened round her like an atmosphere of stormy mist, so swept her on her way, even to the mournful place where Adonais lay. Out of her secret paradise, she sped through camps and cities rough with stone and steel and human hearts, which to her airy tread yielding not, wounded the invisible palms of her tender feet where'er they fell, and barbed tongues, and thoughts more sharp than they rent the soft form they never could repel, whose sacred blood like the young tears of May paved with eternal flowers that undeserving way. In the death chamber for a moment, death, shamed by the presence of that living might, blushed to annihilation, and the breath revisited those lips, and life's pale light flashed through those limbs so late her dear delight. Leave me not wild and drear and comfortless, as silent lightning leaves the starless night. Leave me not, cried Urania. Her distress roused death. Death rose and smiled and met her vain caress. Stay yet a while, speak to me once again, kiss me so long but as a kiss may live. And in my heartless breast and burning brain, that word, that kiss, shall all thoughts else survive with food of saddest memory kept alive. Now thou art dead, as if it were a part of thee, my Adonais, I would give all that I am to be as thou now art, but I am chained to time and cannot thence depart. O oh, gentle child, beautiful as thou wert, why didst thou leave the trodden paths of men too soon? And with weak hands, though mighty heart, dare the unpastured dragon in his den. Defenseless as thou wert, O oh, where was then wisdom the mirrored shield or scorn the spear? Or hadst thou waited the full cycle when thy spirit should have filled its crescent sphere, the monsters of life's waste had fled from thee like deer. The herded wolves bold only to pursue, the obscene ravens clamorous o'er the dead, the vultures to the conqueror's banner true, who feed where desolation first has fed and whose wings reign contagion. How they fled when like Apollo from his golden bow, the Pythian of the aged, one arrow sped and smiled. The spoilers tempt no second blow, they fawn on the proud feet that spurned them lying low. The sun comes forth and many reptiles spawn. He sets and each ephemeral insect then is gathered into death without a dawn and the immortal stars awake again. So is it in the world of living men, a godlike mind soars forth in its delight, making earth bare and veiling heaven. And when it sinks, the swarms that dimmed or shared its light leave to its kindred lamps the spirit's awful night. Thus ceased she. And the mountain shepherds came, their garlands stare, their magic mantles rent. The pilgrim of eternity, whose fame over his living head like heaven is bent, an early but enduring monument came, veiling all the lightnings of his song and sorrow. From her wilds, Aeron sent the sweetest lyrist of her saddest wrong, and love taught grief to fall like music from his tongue. 
Midst others of less note came one frail form, a phantom among men, companionless as the last cloud of an expiring storm whose thunder is its knell. He, as I guess, had gazed on nature's naked loveliness, Actian-like, and now he fled astray with feeble steps over the world's wilderness, and his own thoughts along that rugged way pursued, like raging hounds, their father and their prey. A pard-like spirit, beautiful and swift, a love and desolation masked, a power girt round with weakness. It can scarce uplift the weight of the superincumbent hour. It is a dying lamp, a falling shower, a breaking billow. Even whilst we speak, is it not broken? On the withering flower, the killing sun smiles brightly. On a cheek, the life can burn in blood, even while the heart may break. His head was bound with pansies overblown and faded violets white and pied and blue, and a light spear topped with a cypress cone round whose rude shaft dark ivy tresses grew, yet dripping with the forest's noonday dew, vibrated as the ever-beating heart shook the weak hand that grasped it. Of that crew, he came the last, neglected and apart, a herd abandoned deer, struck by the hunter's dart. Well, we knew there'd be some sort of technological glitch. It looks like we just lost Lucasta Miller as her section was approaching. <laughs> so, um, I've got I've got it, Brian. If you want me to, <clears throat> yeah, go for it, and hopefully we can. I'll see if uh, she she manages to get back in. But go ahead, Mike. Sure. All stood aloof and at his partial moan smiled through their tears. Well knew that gentle band who in another's fate now wept his own, as in the accents of an unknown land he sung new sorrow. Sad Urania scanned the stranger's mien and murmured, Who art thou? He answered not, but with a sudden hand made bare his branded and unsanguined brow, which was like Cain's or Christ's, Oh, that it should be so. What softer voice hey, Mike, is it? You, it looks like we got Lucasta back, so. Fantastic. <laughs> Are you there, Lucasta? Can you unmute? I see you. Can you hear me now? Yes, sorry, sorry we lost you. It could have happened at a worse moment, could I we? know, right? <laughs> where where, <clears throat> where shall I go? Shall I go from 35 then? Uh, yes, that's, so Mike just read 34, so yeah, yeah, why don't you start at 35. What softer voice is hushed over the dead? Athwart what brow is that dark mantle thrown? What form leans sadly o'er the white death bed in mockery of monumental stone? The heavy heart heaving without a moan. If it be he who, gentlest of the wise, taught, soothed, loved, honoured the departed one. Let me not vex with inharmonious sighs the silence of that heart's accepted sacrifice. Our Adonais has drunk poison. Oh, what death and viperous murderer could crown life's early cup with such a draught of woe? The nameless worm would now itself disown. It felt, yet could escape the magic tone, whose prelude held all envy, hate, and wrong, but what was howling in one breast alone, silent with expectation of the song, whose master's hand is cold, whose silver lyre unstrung. Live thou, whose infamy is not thy fame. Live. Fear no heavier chastisement from me, thou noteless blot on a remembered name. But be thyself, and know thyself to be. And ever at thy season be thou free to spill the venom when thy fangs o'erflow. Remorse and self-contempt shall cling to thee. Hot shame shall burn upon thy secret brow, and like a beaten hound tremble thou shalt, as now. 
Nor let us weep that our delight is fled far from these carrion kites that scream below. He wakes or sleeps with the enduring dead. Thou canst not soar where he is sitting now, dust to the dust. But the pure spirit shall flow back to the burning fountain whence it came, a portion of the eternal, which must glow through time and change unquenchably the same, whilst thy cold embers choke the sordid hearth of shame. Peace, peace, he is not dead, he doth not sleep, he hath awakened from the dream of life. Tis we who lost in stormy visions keep with phantoms and unprofitable strife and in mad trance strike with our spirit's knife invulnerable nothings. We decay like corpses in a charnel. Fear and grief convulse us and consume us day by day and cold hopes swarm like worms within our living clay. He has outsoared the shadow of our night. Envy and calumny and hate and pain and that unrest which men miscall the light can touch him not and torture not again. From the contagion of the world's slow stain, he is secure and now can never mourn a heart grown cold, a head grown gray in vain, nor when the spirit self has ceased to burn with sparkless ashes, load and unlamented urn. He lives, he wakes, tis death is dead, not he. Mourn not for Adonais, thou young dawn, turn all thy dew to splendor, for from thee the spirit thou lamentest is not gone. Ye caverns and ye forests, cease to moan, cease ye faint flowers and fountains, and thou air, which like a morning veil thy scarf hast thrown o'er the abandoned earth, now leave it bare even to the joyous stars which smile on its despair. He is made one with nature. There is heard his voice in all her music, from the moan of thunder to the song of night's sweet bird. He is a presence to be felt and known in darkness and in light from herb and stone spreading itself where'er that power may move which has withdrawn his being to its own which wields the world with never wearied love sustains it from beneath and kindles it above he is a portion of the loveliness which once he made more lovely he doth bear his part while the one spirit's plastic stress sweeps through the dull, dense world, compelling there all new successions to the forms they wear, torturing the unwilling dross that checks its flight to its own likeness, as each mass may bear, and bursting in its beauty and its might from trees and beasts and men into the heaven's light. The splendors of the firmament of time may be eclipsed, but are extinguished not. Like stars to their appointed height they climb, and death is a low mist which cannot blot the brightness it may veil. When lofty thought lifts a young heart above its mortal lair, and love and life contend in it, for what shall be its earthly doom, the dead live there and move like winds of light on dark and stormy air. The inheritors of unfulfilled renown rose from their thrones built beyond mortal thought. Far in the unapparent, Chatterton rose pale. His solemn agony has not yet faded from him. Sidney, as he fought and as he fell and as he lived and loved, sublimely mild, a spirit without spot, arose and Lucan, by his death approved, oblivion as they rose shrank like a thing reproved. And many more whose names on earth are dark, but whose transmitted effluence cannot die, so long as fire outlives the parent spark, rose robed in dazzling immortality. Thou art become as one of us, they cry. It was for thee yon kingless fear has long swung bl blind and unascended majesty. 
silent alone amid a heaven of song. Assume thy winged throne, thou vesper of our throng. Who mourns for Adonais? O oh, come forth, fond wretch, and know thyself in him aright. Clasp with thy panting soul the pendulous earth as from the center. Dart thy spirit's light beyond all worlds until thee, until its spacious might satiate the void circumference. Then shrink even to a point within our day and night and keep thy heart light lest it make thee sink when hope has kindled hope and lured thee to the brink. Or go to Rome, which is the sepulchre, or oh, not of him, but of our joy. Tis not that ages, empires, and religions there lie buried in the ravage they have wrought. For such as he can lend, they borrow not glory from those who made the world their prey. And he is gathered to the kings of thought who waged contention with their time's decay. And of the past are all that cannot pass away. Go thou to Rome, at once the paradise, the grave, the city, and the wilderness, and where its wrecks like shattered mountains rise, and flowering weeds and fragrant corpses dress the bones of desolation's nakedness, pass till the spirit of the spot shall lead thy footsteps to a slope of green access where like an infant smile o'er the dead, a light of lighting, laughing flowers along the grass is spread and gray walls molder round on which dull time feeds like slow fire upon a hoary brand and one keen pyramid with wedge sublime pavilioning the dust of him who planned this refuge for his memory doth stand like flame transformed to marble and beneath a field is spread on which a newer band have pitched in heaven's smile their camp of death welcoming him we lose with scarce extinguished breath here pause these graves are all too young as yet to have outgrown the sorrow which consigned its charge to each and if the seal is set here on one fountain of a morning mine, break it not thou. Too surely shalt thou find thine own well full if thou returnest home of tears and gall. From the world's bitter wind seek shelter in the shadow of the tomb. What Adonais is, why fear we to become? The one remains, the many change and pass. Heaven's light forever shines, earth's shadows fly. Life, like a dome of many colored glass, stains the white radiance of eternity until death tramples it to fragments. Die, if thou wouldst be with that which thou dost seek. Follow where all is fled, Rome's azure sky, flowers, ruins, statues, music, words are weak, the glory they transfuse with fitting truth to speak. Why linger? Why turn back? Why shrink my heart? Thy hopes are gone before, from all things here they have departed, thou shouldst now depart. A light has passed from the revolving year, and man and woman and what still is dear attracts to crush, repels to make thee wither. The soft sky smiles, the low wind whispers near, tis Adonai's calls, O oh, hasten thither, no more let life divide what death can join together. That light whose smile kindles the universe, that beauty in which all things work and move, that benediction which the eclipsing curse of birth can quench not, that sustaining love which through the web of being blindly wove by man and beast and earth and air and sea burns bright or dim 
as each are mirrors of the fire for which all thirst now beams on me, consuming the last clouds of cold and brutality. The breath whose might I have invoked in song descends on me. My spirit's bark is driven far from the shore, far from the trembling throng, whose sails were never to the tempest given. The massy earth and spirit skies are riven. I am borne darkly, fearfully, afar, while spurning through the inmost veil of heaven, the soul of Adonais, like a star, beacons from the abode where the eternal are. Thank you so much to all of our readers. Um, that, that final reader there was Giuseppe Albano, the curator of the Keats, House, Keats Shelley House in Rome from reading from uh, basically Keats's bedside uh, in the museum there. And uh, Emily, I think you're up next. Or no? Was Ian going to? I can, but I think Ian was going to. Oh, yes. Uh, okay, so we were gonna do we were gonna do a moment of silence, uh, which Zoom is so weird in terms of <laughs> sound and silence and whatnot. Uh, but. Let's go ahead and do a moment of silence and then we'll go into conversation. And I think my keyboard broke the silence, so. <laughs> So we thought that we might want to take um, a minute to um, talk a little bit about um, the poem and we'd love to invite readers to think about how it felt having listened to the poem today on Keats's death day or having read the poem um, in this um, kind of strange intimacy of being together and apart did anything new occur to you or um, any previous reading or feeling that you had about the poem solidify? So um, we invite you to unmute and, and share your thoughts and, and feelings with us. Wonderful rhymes, just fabulous rhymes. They, they intone, they, they, uh, they entwine all the way through the poem. It's a great experience. I've never, I've never heard um, a Spencerian stanza, uh, you know, read in continuity like that. It's a great experience. I think the um, artifice of the poem that Shelley speaks about struck me more than it ever has, um, and it was more moving to me than it ever has been to hear it read by, by everyone. Um, and it's tribute to Keats through the Spencerian stanzas to all the many echoes of Keats's poems throughout. Um, it's just breathtaking. It's like he was following Keats's advice to knows every risk before. And um, that's why he thought it was ridiculous that the critics were just writing it off. Um, and it would achieve the What it what suggestion that he's listening to Keats's uh, 
uh, advice to Shelley from the letter of August 1820 uh, to load load every rift. I think that's mm. that's a, a really nice point. The the rifts are loaded for sure in, in this poem. It reinforced for me um, what Wordsworth said. Um, I don't imagine he approved of Shelley at all and his ideas, but he said of all of us, he was the best artist. And, and uh, Adonais is a work of extreme, extreme artificiality, but also artifice and craft. And um, thank everybody for, for the reading. It, it was um, very moving. I, uh, I had to bounce between a faculty assembly and this gathering. Um, and that brought home to me um, how lucky I feel and honored to be part of such a community. And I, if you'd told me that I'd be one day reading at an AS aloud with Stuart Curran and Susan Wilson uh, uh, and others uh, and, and younger scholars whom I admire, I, I would have uh, I wouldn't have believed you. So that's wonderful. Um, I I was was actually struck uh, by how much I was swept away by the emotion of the stanzas I was reading against the cr critics, um, and I sort of felt Shelley's anger uh, more than I had before, and uh, that was that was really moving. Mm -hmm. We thought you'd you'd be able to uh, harness that outrage, Jonathan. So I was wondering. I was like, "Well, <laughs> Brian knows me too well." <laughs> but that's yeah, it's such um, a great passage. Uh, forgive forgive my my comment. I just wanted to uh, share something. I think that's uh, sort of pertinent right now, which is this was three years before Browning's death. And he still has the copy of Adonais from the Shelley Society coming to him in Italy. And I think it's a, a, a testament to the endurance. This is the, the catalogue from Sotheby's. But um, it's, it's a testament to the endurance of this poem that E. Browning, whose love of Shelley wavers and comes in and out, as we know, as the tide, it's still there in his library at the end. So I just wanted to add that. Like, like um, Stuart, I was really caught by the rhymes, not only the end rhymes, um, but how much they were echoed in, in midline words and in chains of words that, that weave their way through, through the stanza um, and are either punctuated by end rhymes or the end rhymes themselves are, are beautifully enjammed. I mean, just the craft of this poem in hearing it was really, it was really quite something. I've never really heard, you know, I read it a lot, but to sort of hear hear it vocalized was, was really a different experience. I'll just uh, add that when I was, uh, I feel like uh, I read pretty early in the sequence before things got super heated and it felt very theatrical. Uh, when I was preparing to read, I. I actually tracked the pronouns um, when he seems to refer to Keats and when he is referring to some other allegorical player. Um, and I was, and by doing that, I was just very struck. And again, I'm shy to say this in front of such incredible scholars and poets here, but um, I was really struck by the pronouns and when they felt a little cooler and when they felt really a little shallower and when they felt like this is truly he, he who I can't even say John Keats in this poem, obviously that would ruin the theater of it. On, and some and the illusions, but also the fact that there's like a name that can't be said, and there has to be a mask name. And um, but then the poem says he 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 almost every single line. And I was incredibly moved by that. Um, and my process in in getting ready to read was to really look at all those he's. Something I was struck by was in stanza forty three, how. Um, it says he is a portion of the loveliness which once he made more lovely and yet through this is kind of an obvious observation so forgive me but through um through elegizing keats and through all the other poets who have been inspired by keats and written 
about Keats and written uh, in honor of Keats, Keats is still in a very real way adding to the loveliness which he was only fortunate enough to add on earth um, for such a limited time. Yeah, and I've sent that stanza to people suffering bereavement and they said how much it's meant to them. Um, he has made one with nature. There is heard his voice in all her music. Beautiful thought that your loved one is sort of coming out of the nature around you. Hi, everyone. Um, Kim Blank here. I was very much struck by how good Shelley is when he breaks into uh, uh, natural imagery, when he uses it, especially in, in a metaphorical sense, when he when he uh, breaks into something is like this and it's like that, for example, in stanza 10, like dew upon a sleeping flower and a few lines further on, uh, she faded like a cloud which had outwept its rain. Um, I think sometimes he's at his best when he's most abstract, but calling upon imagery that we all know. Uh, and that struck me as, uh, as weaving power all the way through the poem. Brian, we have some somebody somebody in chat asked to maybe have some discussion of stanza thirty nine, I believe, and the idea that um, that he is not dead, he doth not sleep. If if that person wants to ask the question or say what what intrigues you, or if anybody's willing to say some, it's a it's that power. Yeah, it's a powerful elegiac moment uh, of kind of saying. We might be the dead. Um, this this life is complete. Yeah. Hi there. Thanks for thanks for reading my question. This is such a beautiful event, and I thank you so much for putting this on today. It's been such a treat. My husband and I hurried home from work so we could make it on time, and we've just been basking in the glow of poetry today. Um, so my question was, namely, this is. Um, where would he have gotten this idea that while wait, while living, we are merely dreaming and that the true life begins once we've, once we've left this dream and where would this influence have come? Where would he have read something like this? And what sort of a, what sort of a, a what sort of, you know, how, how did this influence the world around him as people were reading this poem? Where it came from is Calderon, La Vida es Sueño, the Life is a Dream, um, uh, where Calderon in, inverts all the, the norms of life and death, etc. It's also a standard Christian paradox that life with a capital L is beyond time and mortality. And this is just, um, as Shelley always is, um, an extreme um uh sort of you know representation of of that of that paradox which is embedded in christian faith shelley of course is um a secular christian um or a heretical christian but he but he likes the grammar <laughs> and then and then you get the uh, I think, yes. oh sorry sir no, no, I was just going to say, I, 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 to build on Susan's point, I think of the line from St. Paul when he says, I see through a glass darkly, then I shall see face to face, you know, and I shall, I know only in part, then I shall know even as I am known. And so there's always this sort of sense of, of, of um, to, be, to be able to see from that perspective, I think is remarkable and Shelley's voice and his ability to, to put himself and put us in, in an imagined company with Keats to see our now as as a then or our our life as as a potential death compared to his immortality i think is is wonderful I, I, all i was going to add which is perfect to this actually was that that you know that beautiful image of the the dome of many colored glass it's actually traceable to a moment i i argue this in the forthcoming book by uh, which i recommend to everyone um which which is, you know, it's an image from Hartley, um, which he takes from Newton's optics, which is all about the sensorium and light. 
Um, and so it, it is just a, a glorious instance, as as you've all sort of said, of Shelley's uh, kleptomaniac imagination, and yet it sorts it so divinely. That was all I was going to add. <laughs> I think he's also picking up quite a lot from Keats himself, though, isn't he? Because the Keats loves that sleep and death and poetry interaction, and the many coloured glass does sort of slightly echo the Whiffs with awe. I think that's one of the things that occurred to me reading this, that it feels more like reading Nightingale than it feels like reading some of the other Shelley poems that he captures some of Keats's favourite rhythms. And there's some lovely sort of, as already mentioned, some lovely cross sort of cross echoes. The one that struck me was that the fast fading violets covered up in leaves are the faded violets white and pied and blue the pard like spirit has in this poem. So he's obviously being sort of reading Keats really carefully to write this and being very careful in his sort of incorporation of echoes. I think probably the project conveners were right to leave off the preface, which always seems to me to be a little bit more about Shelley's problems than it is about Keats's, but it's clear he's playing, he's, he's paying very careful attention and actually thinking about Keats as well as about himself in writing the elegy. There were um, people in our um, chat stream who are rightly also tracing it to broad platonic and neoplatonic ideas. And um, I'd wrap it in a bow and talk about his own syncretic methods where all of these things feed into each other and grow from each other. And that he's actually pulling this life maybe just, you know, the thing we need to see through to get to real life in his early poetry. So it's not even something he came to late in his career. This is something he was thinking about throughout his career. Okay, thank you everyone so much. This has been such a, a wonderful event. It's been really terrific. And, and thank you especially uh, to all our readers um, and to everyone who's uh, taken the time out to uh, be with us uh, today. Um, we'd like to leave with uh, a benediction. This living hand, now warm and capable of earnest grasping wood, if it were cold and in the icy silence of the tomb, so haunt thy days and chill thy dreaming nights that thou would wish thine own heart dry of blood so in my veins red life might stream again and thou be conscience calmed. See, here it is. I hold it towards you. Thanks again, everyone. Just leaving this on so people can get their thanks in the in the chat and everything. Uh, yeah, thank you to our readers. That was just such a such a wonderful performance uh, with all of you together. You're here. Thank you all. Thanks, Brian. And everyone. Thank you, Com It's nice to meet you in in not just Twitter. <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to say there's something so moving about the idea that, um, you know, as as people have noted that that you know Shelley didn't know Keats well at all, and right. um, and that I'm, I'm I was thinking about as we you know I, I I gather and I understand that many of the people on this call are friends, uh, but many others aren't. Uh, and there's something to me very moving about this sort of group of strangers coming together, to, you know, in some cases to um, um, to summon the presence of, of someone else whom none of us know, but feel all, all of us feel as though we do. Um, so, yeah, we're all yeah. friends of Keats, right? Well, I was, yeah. Brian, I was just I was just going to say we're all mutual friends of Keats. <laughs> <laughs> and one one thing. 
Shelley absolutely championed this poem from its inception. I mean, he had it printed himself. He, and in his letters, uh, until his death, he's always asking, how is Agnes doing, you know? And it's like it was, it, it really expressed something central to him about his relationship with the world and the poet's relationship with the world. And so he'd be happy with this event. Right, sociable Keats, you know, that, that's such mm -hmm. a, a part of who he was as a, a poet and a, and a person. I was tweeting earlier today just about one of the things that always strikes me about the, uh, the afterlives of, of Keats is that the people who knew him, um, who lived for decades and decades later, continue to just be deeply marked by their time knowing him. And uh, even people who didn't really know him, who you know were just sort of tangentially connected, you see these reflections decades and decades <laughs> later about uh, how much uh, they were affected by Keats in that short time that he was alive or that they knew them. So, yeah. And obviously continues uh, uh, onward. Um, I, there's that poem by uh, Robert Browning where he, he meets someone who knew Shelley, right? And he's thinking about like his, his once removed connection to the, the romantic poets. So we've got a few more removes, but. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if anyone wants to, I mean, if people want to stick around and chat, we can keep chatting. We 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 knew some people had to go right at four, so we wanted to make that uh, four o'clock my time. I don't know what time it is. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you so much for inviting me and to apologize for being the one whose technology failed at the absolutely worst possible moment but it was an amazing experience to hear the whole poem being read like that yeah also, I guess we, yeah your reading was uh, we there were uh, everybody's reading was, was wonderful yours was uh kind of was spectacular uh on really on top oh of my god it was oh, I'm, so I'm in I'm a glad. state of total panic when i'm like sticking <sighs> wires into the computer and I'm glad the gods of Wi-Fi um, heard our collective cry. <laughs> it was great, but there's also something, isn't there, in Keats about the idea of like voice breaking sometimes, or or, yeah, or, yeah. or seeming like it might break and then being restored. That yeah, all, yeah. All yeah. Right. But it, I also kept thinking of the. I, I mean, I totally agree as well. The extraordinary artistry of 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 Adonais, mm. but when you compare it to the complete literary opposite which is the letters that Joseph Seven wrote describing Keats's last weeks and days in Rome it's you know I, I almost don't quite know what to do with these with these two very different literary um, texts I mean because if you read Seven it makes you think that Shelley is rather cold and not intimate. I mean, it's an incredible work of art, but it doesn't have that, um, you know, that absolutely sort of in the moment, palpable sense of desperation. Um, I don't know, what do people feel about that and how we react differently to these different types of things? Well, uh, I, for one, I'm glad you brought up Severn because when I'm, when I'm thinking of poor Keats, literally rotting away in front of him. Oh. I, I think, uh, first of all, how horrendous this must have been. But I also think of, of poor Severin. Um, oh, uh, yes. uh, and and you know, through his letters, it's clear that he's completely traumatized. It's but clear he, he's helpless. And it's- you know the anecdote about him when he was a little boy, when he was eight years old, he went swimming in um, with a friend and the friend drowned and seven aged eight had to take the friend's clothes back to his parents and give them the terrible news. And it just makes me think, well, why did he agree to, it's like he wanted to save a friend and it was a trying to, it was reflecting that in some way biographically. 
Yes. Uh, he just keeps saying the whole thing is just ghastly, watching Living Dead. And I also think uh, of the moment when, when Keats is, is grasping for and trying to get something to kill himself. He, he's grasping for some, some opium just so he can fade away. Um, but he can't. And uh, anyway, so it's a, it's uh, beside the celebration of it all. There's also something to think about uh, about the power of humor and nature at these at these very interesting moments. That in truth, we shouldn't know anything about, but we know a lot about them, and that's remarkable as well. I agree. Sorry, I leapt in like that. I'm very unused to doing these Zoom calls, and I get all excited and think I'm having a sort of real conversation. Yes. Yes. It is, it's a strange uh, technological and whatever else uh, thing to, to navigate. But yeah, I, I figured, you know, there was going to be some sort of technical stuff that, that went wrong. And if if nothing did, that would have been strange. So, uh, but yeah, we, it, it, it worked out okay. I'm glad we got you back in time to have you read at least part of that mm -hmm. section. Anyway, thank you again. It's now 10 past 11 at night and I've done various Keats events today and I'm really tired. So I'm going to go, I can just say good night to everyone, but thank you so much again for inviting me because it really meant a lot. Thank you. Thank again. you everybody. Great to have you. Bye-bye. I wanted to say one thing. Um, since I had the gift of the One Remains a stanza, I find that stanza very contradictory. Um, Shelley is annihilating everything that he is gorgeously good at. That's why I paused over words. I mean, this is a fabulous creation in words. And Shelley's argument is to annihilate words. Um, this is not a Keatsian um, aesthetic or a Keatsian existential philosophy. Keats was very much in this world as a veil of soul making and very much skeptical about um, philosophies that Shelley invests in this very poem of life being not in this world, but with a capital L elsewhere. So I find this stanza profoundly and compellingly contradictory, where its poetry and its argument are on completely opposite sides. So I just want to make a case for um, you know, I love this poem for Shelley's art, but it's not about Keats, it's about Shelley. Um, Keats is the occasion for Shelley to produce this fabulous poem, but um, it is on a very deep level, a misreading of Keats or a willful appropriation of Keats to Shelley's, um, to Shelley's own philosophy. And if you want to put it less generously to Shelley's polemics with the reviews, um, mm -hmm. Keats was much more resilient as we all know about the reviews than Shelley's mythology would have it. And this damaged Keats all the way up until Milne's Life Letters and Literary Remains, which turned, turned the story around. So that, I mean, I loved reading this stanza, but it's, you know, it's not, um, it's not about Keats. That was actually one of the, one of the things when the, the KLP editors were all talking about what we wanted to do uh, for today. Um, you know, we when we were throwing around the idea of Adonais, that was one consideration. Like, well, it's really it's so much more about Shelley than Keats, but um, but I think nonetheless, right? I mean, it has uh, such uh, influence on how we think about Keats, sometimes in misleading and uh, you know not great ways the whole right that Anne talked about in her her intro right the the sickly flower um but uh yeah one one thing I've been thinking a lot about too is just how many other elegies for Keats or just poems written to Keats inspired by Keats there are out there the on on the Keats Letters Project website we published a couple things in the lead up to today with um featuring some other examples of uh, 19th century poems and then a bunch of more recent ones. And I don't know if we, do we have some poets still in the audience? And uh, I mean, Joyelle obviously could, could address this, but I'm just endlessly fascinated by the, uh, the way that poets respond to Keats. And, and it seems like it's something that 
continues until today in a very like robust way. But I mean, there's just so many poems about Keats out there. <laughs> mm. Mike, you're you're kind of a poet, so you could. <laughs> I hang out with poets. <laughs> I mean, actually, I'd, I'd be a little interested almost with Joya. So I don't mean to put you into uh, like a lineage at all, Joya, but like. I mean, when I think about Keats, right, there is a clearly an American line of Keatsian poets and, and one of Joyelle's teachers, Jory Graham, who was at Iowa. She was at Iowa when you were still there, Joyelle, is that right? And I don't mean to imply that there is necessarily a connection, but, but Jory is a, a major poet of our day and a total Keatsian. Um, and so I have a feeling that that influence has been one, but, but again, there are some pretty big teacher poets out there as well. So Ed Hirsch, who did the book on, he did a small book on Keats's sonnets, um, right? So I, it just feels as though with certain key poets that then, uh, you know, they did a lot of work to, to kind of spread the, the gospel of Keats a bit. Joelle, I don't mean to imply that there's any lineage there, but was there, I'm, I'm right about Jory, right? Yeah, there was, there was some overlap uh, there when I was yeah. there. And, you know, um, but for me personally, I, I took a class in the romantics at college, uh, but then I went pretty much all the way around the world in my influences. I run a small press uh, for people who are just meeting me tonight. I run a small press called Action Books and we publish uh, modernist inflected and modernist poetry from pretty much around the world including major master poets like Raul Zorita of Chile, Kim Soon of Korea, um, Osabar of Sweden, Hiromi Ito of Japan. So lots of contemporary kind of master poets who are themselves influenced by modernism um, in their kind of scope and in their kind of use of voice. So for me to come back to Keats, um, it was something that came back into, I, I mean, I did all the reading in a very like schoolboy way. And, you know, of course those, those sounds and the stay with you forever. Um, and uh, I came back around to Keats when I started asking myself uh, the question of what, what is the lyric? Um, which is a question obviously all critics and poets ask themselves forever. It's an, um, you know, I feel like there's all kinds of uh, triage answers to that. And when I wanted to think about the, uh, the brevity, what I associate with lyric, um, and of course we can answer this any number of ways, uh, but uh, for me, I was thinking a lot, not necessarily about the addressability, which of course we can talk about with Keats forever, but about um, brevity and not just brevity, fatality, uh, this notion that there are certain forms that we know are gonna end. Um, and even though obviously he steadfastly pursued his epics, um, his poems almost come with an end. It's almost like he's racing his poem to the, to the end. Um, again, this might just be me. And so when I thought about like lyric brevity and pace and something that I would call fatality, I thought a lot about Keats. And when I thought about lyric sweetness or intensity, I thought about this pairing of like sweetness and toxicity. It also made me think of Keats. So suddenly I had Keats on the brain. Um, and I found myself writing, writing, writing um, this crown of sonnets for Keats, but I also felt that I was in a place of fandom, almost a very contemporary fandom, that I was almost consuming him, like eating him alive. And then when I started thinking about that, I started thinking about the, the tuberculosis pistol and that really did eat him alive. So then I was really off to the races. I had so much to juggle and move through. So that's my personal story with Keats. It was sort of like a return to Keats when I wanted to think about something that felt essential. Um, and then maybe to kind of turn to um, Dylan Thomas, like the, the force that through the green, uh, the fuse, now I'm, I'm mixing up my quote, but basically in thinking about the fuse going through the flower, I think I just like re-encountered Keats's encounter with the world. So I think I started pretty narrowly thinking about what is this intensity? What is this sweetness? What is this toxicity and this fatality that I associate with Keats? And then through him, and again, rereading the letters and moving through the biographies, I feel like I almost re-encountered like a whole world of poetry as he was encountering a world. I wonder if there's also something about Keats as letter writer. I mean, not to put too fine a point on it in the organization that's brought us together here, but that makes him accessible to, to poets, you know, that. Keats feels sort of personable in a way that 
Um, not every, you know, not, not every poet does uh, because of how wonderful a letter writer he is. Yeah, you're, you're, you're totally right, I think. I mean, uh, as Mike just said in the chat, we'll, we'll send you your, your check from the KLP later <laughs> for the plug. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it just, I can't tell you how many times I'll read an essay about something in contemporary poetry and see negative capability, of course, right, is usually the, the go-to that gets mentioned all the time. I just, I was reading an essay by Ross Gay the other day in which he talks about negative capability um, that was just published, you know, a couple days ago. Uh, I, but, I, I, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, I know that like Elizabeth Bishop, who's, you know, obviously major 20th century, mid-century mid poet who loved Keats, uh, I've, I've read that in her, um, in her poetry workshops, which she didn't love to give, but she did give towards the end of her life. Um, she told the students that they had to read Keats's letters, but that they didn't necessarily have to read his poems or that the letters were the priority to her. Wow. Um, and that says something about Bishop, but she's of course a, a major figure in terms of poetic influence and in, in our landscape now too. I think one, one, oh, one interesting thing about so many statements in the letters that so sort of resonant and, and sort of beautiful prose. But if you examine them, I mean, he says poetry is better come as naturally leads to a tree or not come at all. But if you look at his actual writing method, he often sat down and I will write poetry and sort of dressed up, I believe. So he didn't always, um, I think it's also possible to interrogate the statements he makes, even though they're so kind of beautifully expressed and seem like total nuggets of truth. But um, they're not as above crystal examination. Yeah, I think it's the 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 like personal intimacy that we get about Keats too. So I, I'm just trying to think of like, um, well, actually, Cameron, I think you tweeted the Tom Gunn poem Keats at Highgate, uh, right? And like, uh, there are so many examples like that where it's it's not necessarily about Keats as poet, but it's like Keats as person, uh, and the letters mm -hmm. give give such a, a clear picture of uh, an intimate access to like mm. Keats as a person out and about around town um right or like the uh the oh. Dean Young, Young poem where Keats is the surgeon who uh is operating on this poor kid who's gonna die from a gangrenous leg you know um it's Keats the 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 person that that so often surfaces in in the poems, and I think the letters give, uh, obviously, give a lot of that access and that sense of intimacy. I, I think we're very lucky um, uh, that we, he wrote to his um, uh, his family, um, because family letters are different than letters to your friends, where you might have a bit of bravado, or you might show off, or I, uh, you might name drop. Um, but the fact that he was writing to those who knew him so well, and particularly the, the long journal letters. Um, to America, without those, we wouldn't know him in quite the same way, and he wouldn't have said quite the same things. So I think knowing Keats has a fair amount to do with um, uh, who he could write to as well. Uh, and the other part that has always struck me about Keats is, I sort of imagine him coming into the Hunt Circle, and he's a nobody. He's an absolute nobody. Um, and yet it takes literally moments, days, a few weeks, uh, and he's thrown in with and becomes friends with uh, uh, people who are older, established, well-known, and it seems like they all love him. So how is this young, unknown poet suddenly not just taken under the wings by people like Hunt, who's a bit more uh, of that type, but how does he immediately um, be embraced by these older, more established um, uh, London intelligentsia? Uh, they take him in immediately. And again, he's a nobody and there are somebodies. And I always think there must have been some, there's something about Keats um, that made them say, come on in, let's, we, we'd like to talk to you. 
Mike's suggestion. I'm, I'm just joking, of course, Kim. Uh, right, but so I love it, right? But uh, I love I love Keats increasingly for his humor, and one had to think, right, that um, that in person that humor, and we know from various accounts that it was a it was a shimmering humor, and that he really he he had a good. And I don't mean anything negative by this. He had a good act, right? People were taken by him. He was charismatic and he drew people in th through his whole life. But yeah, there was there was something to that, that yeah, the letters give us more direct access to than, than perhaps the, the bulk of the, the poems, yeah. And he, and he had really good hair too. <laughs> that may have helped. I, I would not know. <laughs> Mike, you gotta... Let the get the get the bun out. Show us those locks. Buns, buns, bun stain. <laughs> Come on, Mike. Would you do it for me? <laughs> okay, fine, Professor Tooney. <laughs> well, if Mike is going to leave his hair. In <gasps> Then what's the point, right? Exactly. Let's let's just let's just end it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, th thank you all again so much. Uh, thanks for sticking around for extra time uh, to have a little more informal conversation. It's been really nice, both uh, the earlier parts of the event and and this conversation. So, uh, thank you again to everyone, and uh, we'll see you at the three hundredth uh, anniversary. <laughs> Bye bye. Bye. Bye, bye everybody. Thank you.